following announcement has been paid for by the New World Order. Remember this, when you're the greatest fighter in the world today, they got a name for you. They don't call you a great fighter, they call you Chael Sonnen. Beat me, if you can. And after tonight, none of you in this ring will ever Talking to the Rolex wearing, diamond ring wearing, kids stealing, woo, wheeling, dealing, limousine like jet flying, son of a gun, and I'm having a hard time holding these alligators down. Woo! I'm gonna drink a Coors Light. That's a Coors Light because Bud Light won't pay me nothing. And I have in my cold beer. You have your cold beer? If not, you are fucking jabroni. Wash it down with one beer, two beers, three beers, a shot of whiskey. You become a motherfucker. The following announcement has been paid for by the New World Order. All right, welcome to the filthy FRB show. And this is a little bit different guest than uh, you guys are accustomed to because I know you guys like fighting and you like women. So I, I we've covered the fighting part of things and we needed to bring in the estrogen part of this. She's a uh, FHM Hot 50 name to that list as well as a Maxim Hot 100. She's a, a Paul Heyman girl. And she's the one who uh, hit me up and said, hey, who's this guy who has his Twitter profile that says UFC enhancement talent? <laughs> Alira Coors, how are you doing? I'm good. Thank you, guys. Thanks for having me. <laughs> that's, hey, Tom, that's a real story, too. Yeah. Well, hey, it's legit. <laughs> I am. I'm the Brooklyn brawler of the UFC. Yeah. Currently, so yeah, she asked, "What is enhancement?" I think like she thought maybe it was like something like, you know, uh, dirty or something. She's like, "What does this mean? Who is this guy?" Yeah, maybe, <laughs> maybe uh, you know, a reference to Viagra or yeah. uh, what are they? Extends pills? Are those the ones that you're thinking about? Natural male enhancement? Is, was that where you were going with that, Alira? Oh, I just got cut off from you guys, and I was like, oh, hang on, what's going on here? I'm like, it's all quiet, so I just missed that whole conversation that you guys just had with me. Oh, you, so, you, um, you definitely know Paul Heyman. You're so, uh, you... I do, I do. He's such a lovely guy. You know, he's, uh, he's a very influential man, and he's helped out my career like you wouldn't, you wouldn't believe. So I'm very lucky that I'm in his little wolf pack. Yeah. Well, don't worry, Alira. The only stuff that we said while you weren't listening was how beautiful you are. And <laughs> how great of a guest you are. So don't worry. I'll, I'll, about, <laughs> don't worry about I'll kill you later when I listen back. <laughs> uh, so it, we just went from talking about um, Masterone and Androstein or Androstein mm. to uh, to Alira Core. So it's a, it's a nice uh, <laughs> transition. So what's your background? You know, you're obviously from Australia, but. Tell us your yeah. background, you know, what were you like in high school? Were you, were you cool in high school or were you one of these, one of these girls that just kind of like everything came together in your 20s? Uh, you, know, you know, a bit of both. Like growing up, um, you know, I think majority of Australian young women, we're, we're pretty laid back. We, you know, we enjoy the surf. We're pretty tomboyish. So we don't take things too seriously and some sort of, you know, wake up and go the other way and become prima donnas and the others kind of just stay cool and, you know, end up falling on their feet in a modeling career but still have that very tomboyish aspect. And that's exactly where I'm at. You know, anybody that meets me knows that I haven't really changed that much from when I was younger. Um, I don't take, don't take things too seriously, but I take my work seriously. Um, so, you know, I'm pretty cruisy and it's kind of stayed the same really. See, that's interesting because Tom doesn't take anything seriously <laughs> but he's got this big head, you know, that like, I, I don't even, like, he totally big leagued me this weekend in Las Vegas. I was there for four days just hanging wow. out, drinking, you know, talking to people. And I was like, come on, Tom, you know, come, come hang out, come have a few. 
And he kept stringing me along, and he never showed up. Oh, standing up. Not good at all. Well, I learned from the best while I was in Australia for a few months uh, with the Australian <laughs> Don't woman. bring us Aussies into the mix. Yeah, the Australian <laughs> this woman. This is just you. Uh, they showed me how to string people along. Uh, <laughs> and, and Brian, that's really not how the story went down completely, but... Um, I'll let you have, you know, I'll let you have your time in the sun and you can, uh, think whatever you want. You can, you can frame the story how you'd like, but this revisionist history isn't going to go on forever. So you're not even going to defend yourself? You're not even going to tell the... What do you, do you want me to use the Anderson Silva excuse? Yeah. And say <laughs> that nothing happened, nothing was wrong. Um, <laughs> I'll give you the legit thing was I was off buying a car all day. And uh, my phone started dying, and uh, that, that was basically it. Yeah, it was it was it was a good time. I, I was just about at the end of the line because I had started around noon, and this was after the fight. So, I um, I had hit my peak, and then I was I was on the down slope. You know, it was one of those um, <laughs> downward spiral. Yeah, yeah. The, Coming you know, in hot off the runway, as we right, say. Right. The uh, law of diminishing returns, but. Um, <laughs> So, Interestingly enough, Brian, that, that? Uh, that's pretty much the same path my life is going down lately. <laughs> so I, I hit my peak, and it's been a steady downhill decline ever since. But you see and now it's just a hot mess. <laughs> but uh, Alira didn't know, but you're coming back this summer to the UFC. Because I'm like, you know, I'm doing this podcast thing with Tom Waller, and they're like, yeah, mm. I like him. How's he doing? Is, does he still fight? I'm like, yeah, well, yeah, he's coming back to the UFC, man. He's, he's still under contract. So this summer – is the summer of Lawler. Wow. Well, congratulations. Yeah. I'm keen to see you uh, back there and fighting. Yeah, me neither. Um, yeah, hopefully it's this, <laughs> hopefully it's this summer. I don't, I don't have anything uh, 100%. I'm actually, and if anybody out there listening um, would like to start a Twitter campaign between all 10 of you, then I would <laughs> personally love to fight on the Glasgow Scotland show uh, that's coming up in July. So let Joe Silva know, let Dana White know, um, let them know you actually know who I am first because they probably don't. And then, uh, and then get me a fight in Glasgow, Scotland. So, uh, so hopefully that goes down. So you just got to start posting, you know, bikini pictures and hashtagging that'll gain some traction. <laughs> you're, you're Seems pro, to work well. <laughs> you're a pro at that. Tom, <laughs> Tom mentioned uh, Dana White, and mm. so like you've you've been in communication with him because you wanted to be an octagon girl. I, I think mm -hmm. you're I think you're way overqualified, but you you know you wanted something just to dip your feet into to get yeah. yourself on the road. So how did, how did you get Dana's attention? And you you I think you went to the headquarters to meet him. Like, what's the story? I with did. That? I uh, I just started bombarding him, you know, he wasn't following me on Twitter and I was just heckling him non-stop and I just got like this little Alira army behind me just basically absolutely harassing Dana White and just saying, you know, hi, this girl, this girl, this Australian girl wants to be within UFC and then it sort of just went from there and then I had a holiday in Vegas and I went and met Dana at the office and funnily enough, the... Um, that famous uh, chair or like throne that was in the tap out office um, was actually delivered to Dana's office that day. So I got to sit in this cool bloody chair that it was in um, Mask's office as a present for Dana. So, you know, had this meeting with him and sort of just facilitated something from there. And then it just, you know, it's sort of kept in contact, but it's been two years and, you know, I'm still not, I'm gaining traction, but I'm still not, wearing a UFC t-shirt and I'm still not employed by them so I don't really know what I'm doing wrong here. Tom what's she doing wrong because there's something wrong when you have a piece of paper that says you're a UFC employee or contractor and she's not I mean look oh come <laughs> on man that's that's brutal there, there, I mean there, there's something wrong with the world well you know hearing her story the first thing uh, I can say is that I think she's going down the right path because she said she's not wearing a UFC t-shirt. Um, so I'm going to, you know, use my imagination on that one. And, uh, it, I'll say that's the correct thing to do if you're showing up at the UFC offices. Um, hey, I don't know, Brian. I, I've somehow kept a job with the UFC for going on. I think this will be the seventh year. Um, and I'm trying to figure out how I do it. So 
I can't mm. offer much in the way of uh, expertise. I believe um, timing is everything. Timing is the essence of everything. So I'm not one to sort of push the situation. I'll let them know that I'm there and I obviously I'm on I'm on deck and I want to work and you know what. But, you know, it's hard for me being here in Australia and we only really have two fights a year. I can, I can understand where they're coming from. But, you know, I'm going to be on the American doorstep soon and they won't be able to get rid of me. You know, it's interesting. Like this kind of this subject, in a way, came up when I was in Vegas at the fights this past weekend. I was talking to the the boyfriend of one of the uh, current Octagon girls, and there was another mm. guy. There was another guy there. Um, I won't mention his name, but he knows who he is. And um, he's a big fan of yours. He he's a big Alira Coors fan. Oh, beautiful. And and he he's pretty he's pretty well known. You probably know who he is. Yeah, I'll tell you later. But. Um, but he he said it's like no, the UFC likes um, like you have to be like very slim and not have like too yeah, much like you, curves. Yeah, you can't be a woman, right? You know, which I which I think is a shame because you know the average male really likes a woman. They don't like a boy with fake tits. I'm sorry, but it's you know I think it's quite sad. But hey, I understand that that's the way it goes. But my body shape is normal and I'm not going anywhere. You know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to change my body shape and not be who I am just because it doesn't fit a company's profile. Like, I think that's quite sad because, you know, there's a lot of men out there that do like the women for the way that they are. And I think it's, um, you know, I'm going to change their, their perception on that. Yeah. You know, I'm healthy. I'm fit. I have abs, you know, I've got, you know, a good definition to my body. I'm not going to, you know, start living off lettuce and not go out and drink beer and eat ribs just because, you know, they, they want somebody that's overly skinny. Now, do you know any of the current Octagon girls? Are you, like, friendly with them or do they see you as kind of like a threat? Um, I don't think they see me as a threat because they don't really know who I am, but I have been in the vicinity of them um, within a party and being, you know, in the little area with two of the most well-known ones, and I can say that they weren't overly lovely, but I don't really give a shit. I'm Australian. I don't take a backward step. You either want to be my friend or you don't. I'm sure that's that simple. I'm sure they do know who you are. They know who I am. I mean, if they, I mean put it, they know who I am, so I'm sure they know who you are. They know who Tom is. No, they don't. <laughs> you know, it's just one of those things. Females will be females, and, you know, it's quite unfortunate that, they don't support each other. And I'm always like that within my career. I, I'm never one to, to rain on another female's parade because she's doing well. I actually applaud her. And I think it's amazing that a chick is out there killing it. I'm not one to have green in my eyes over it. You know, if it's just such a shame, but it is what it is. You know, I can't really control how they see things. I can't really control how I see things. I'm wondering, Tom, if her issue is that she's not a recording artist as well as a model because you have to be like multi talented. Well, you could also. I go- am multi talented, <laughs> thank you. You could go back to art school, Alira, if you'd. Uh, and paint with my feet. Yeah, I- I've heard that works well. Um, as well. Oh, now, you, mean, you mean rehab? <laughs> no, no, no. It, okay. Alira, you mentioned earlier, um, you know, you talked about being a real woman. And me, myself, as a real man, uh, I really pride myself on, on uh, you know, manly manly chest chest and pecs. yeah, and, and on portraying something, you know, from my ra- my uh, my gender. And you did say, and it, it's kind of interesting to me because I know a lot of Australians uh, venture off to Thailand. Have you been to Thailand? Yeah, you have. 100%. Yeah. Well, you said that most men don't like boys with fake tits. <laughs> So I'm wondering <laughs> how much time you've really spent in Thailand. You love to go there and get your fake pecs put in. That's where yeah. that uh, <laughs> that transgender fighter went to get. Hey, to get look, Brian, it's some of the best plastic surgery in the world. I work in medical here in Australia, and I understand the ethical standard of things. And you know, being over there and seeing how the hospitals operate, like I would go over there and have open heart surgery. Like I believe in that place so much that it's, it's, it's amazing. They turn men into women for God's sake. Yeah. But Brian, you mentioned uh, transgender, but I, I, at least I believe that's what you said. Did you say transgender or transgender? Uh, <laughs> oh, that was because, smooth. Yes. Uh, what's the story with that? Is that official? He's going, he's going to become a female. 
I think so. Like, you know, we only really get the um, little snippets over here in Australia, but, you know, good on him. If he wants to do that, let him do it. Like, imagine walking around with that monkey on your back every day of trying to, you know, you're a female, but really you're a man. Like, it's just, I feel, I kind of, I'm, I empathize and I feel sorry for them because it wouldn't be nice. I'm pretty open to that sort of stuff. I'm, I'm not homophobic. I don't worry about, um, you know, gays and lesbians and people that are different. I embrace them, you know, because people are so critical these days that I think it's just wrong that they point the finger because it's not normal. We'll define normal. Like, I think it's sad that they can't be themselves. I mean, and that's exactly the way I feel because, you know, I, I mean, I like Tom Waller. I mean, not in that way, but like he has a kind of an alternative lifestyle with this guy named Seth, Seth Petrozelli. He knocked out Kimbo Slice yeah. about six or seven years ago. And they have kind of this uh, alternative lifestyle. And, you know, I don't, I don't cry too much. I just kind of, you know, just ignore it. But I, I like Tom, you know. If by alternative yeah. lifestyle you mean that uh, Seth and I each individually sleep with attractive women – um, maybe, maybe that is an alternative to a lot of people. Um, but to me, it's just... There's always got to be one in the mix of chucking the women. Yeah. Alira, you also said, you know, you're talking about Bruce Jenner. You said that walking around with a monkey on your back, like that must be pretty tough. Now, I've seen, you know, Chris Kardashian or Chris Jenner, and she's not that ugly. I wouldn't call she's her... She's actually monkey. smoking hot for her age. Yeah, I wouldn't call her a monkey by any means. Yeah, Be- <laughs> Bieber was after her. Bieber thought she was hot. Well, yeah, I'm sure there would be many men that would like to have their shoes at the end of her bed. <laughs> so I-, I know you also do like – like you do some interviewing and I, I, uh, yeah. I was very impressed because you can string a couple sentences together unlike Ariane – you know, uh, you know, who can't really do that. So do you ever have a problem of people taking you seriously because they're just like, oh, uh, you know, here's this, uh, here's this bimbo, you know, she can't possibly have any intellect. Just look at her. Do you ever get yeah, that? Yeah. You know, that's, um, that's the one thing that I find with people is they like, go, ah, you know, she's a model. And I'm like, well, just give me five minutes to, you know, just, just listen. And then after that, they kind of go, oh, okay, you know, she actually can speak. She's not just tits and ass. So that's what I really wanted to push across within my work is that, you know, it's unfortunate that some people who work within the modeling career get tarnished because there's some real idiots out there that, like, they're not intellectual. They can't speak. They can't put things together. So I wanted to prove them wrong and, you know, it's just one of those things. I'm not going to really worry if uh, something doesn't come into fruition with UFC because I have many other bigger fish to fry. So what else are you looking at? Like, I, I know you're, you're very involved, um, and even Tom's gone on a, a couple of these trips. Like, over here they call them USO tours where you go yeah. to, like, Afghanistan or, or Iraq. Yep. I don't know what it's called in Australia, but, like, you go on a lot of those trips, right? Yeah, yeah, I have. I um, I just got back from Afghanistan in November. So that was a trip of a lifetime. You know, we had a few dodgy moments while we were over there. And uh, I must say that I do these things because it gives me a greater sense of appreciation of home and what it's like here because we just don't realize how tough not only are our soldiers doing it over there, but everybody else that lives in that country, you're just so lucky. Like a simple thing of going to get a cup of coffee by the beach. Like you just can't, you just don't have that freedom there. And, you know, I just feel like I need to do something to give back to our deployed personnel that are away, um, you know, putting their ass on the line every single day. So yeah, Tom, talk a little bit about your experience going overseas visiting the troops. Do you have a like similar take on it as her? Yeah, yeah. Actually, first, Alira, where in Afghanistan did you go? I went to Kandahar and then okay. down to Kabul. Okay. Yeah, I had so, a an opposite uh, experience, I guess, because I was up in the north in Mazari Sharif. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, on the on the same token, it was a great experience. It really made me, you know, not so much miss the stuff at home, but appreciate it yeah, uh, yeah. greatly. You know, I have a great time going on these tours. Uh, the last one I did was Afghanistan and Kuwait. And uh, mm. in two weeks' time, I'm actually going over to uh, Europe, which – Beautiful. God, yeah, I hope everybody out there listening really uh, really sits down and prays for me 
and wishes for the best because going to Italy, um, (laughs) Crete, Turkey, uh, and and Greece, you know, uh, those places, I don't know very many people that would like to get to see those places. (laughs) It's It's such a shit, horrible job that you've got, isn't it? (laughs) Uh, It's terrible sometimes. Um, But on the flip side, you know, it, it is a chance for me to give something back. And as small as it is, um, you know, in my mind, I go to military bases, I'll uh, perform at some seminars, I'll show some moves, I'll sign some autographs. But it's amazing to me that people are even showing up um, to learn this stuff. Uh, yeah. I don't view myself as anything special, believe me. And uh, what the troops are doing, uh, not only American troops, but the, uh, the Anzac troops as well, mm. um, you know, it, it's kind of... It puts things in perspective for you. And to me, that's... It does. Yeah, it really, um, you know, we had a few dodgy moments over there where uh, the heart rate was definitely um, up there. And, you know, it just made me realize life is so short and it can just change ever so quickly. And it's, uh, you know, I just really take my hat off to everybody, not only the Australians, but it's so many different countries and contingencies that go into these areas and you just think, you know, these are husbands and these are wives and these are dads and grandfathers and you just, you know, they've, they've got families at home, they've got loved ones at home, they're friends and they're just doing this to kind of keep things in check and it's just, yeah, I just come home and I just want to go again. You know, I'm lo- really looking forward to going away again. So when you're there, I mean, it's not like you can't check into the Marriott. Like, where are you? No. Where, where's your accommodations? Is it like a tent? I'm on base. Like, I basically, the time I, I get into, like, my military compound in Australia, from the time I step foot on that base, I am under military law. So if I'm naughty and I do something really bad, I'm under the military judicial system. Uh, I'm not. I don't have a judge like a normal judge. I have a military judge. So... I get treated exactly the same. Um, you know, I get yelled at if I'm not listening. Um, so now, it's just what, one of those things. But what would what could you possibly do that's naughty on on base? Oh, well, the thing is, Australians, um, there's no alcohol on base at all. Um, so if you get caught drinking, that's it. Like you get in a lot of trouble. Um, if you, you know, you just you got to have a level of respect as well. You know, even knowing that we get treated, that we are a civilian, we're not military personnel. You still need to have that level of respect for the people that have worked their way up into the ranks. Like if they're talking, you listen. You don't, you don't sit there and be a smart ass and keep talking to the mate next to you. You know, it's just you just it's like kind of being back at school again, I guess. Sure. Now, is that kind of like your experience, Tom, when you when you're over there? Yeah, absolutely. We, as soon as we arrive at the airport, we have military orders. Uh, we're also not allowed, it depends on, uh, on what base I believe. Um, mm. but in a lot of places we're not allowed to drink. Um, yeah. it's no and fun. I've been on base. Yeah. I've been on German bases, German run bases where the Americans aren't allowed to drink because, you know, I guess we have a reputation for being assholes. <laughs> uh, so you've got a, you know, you got a German run base probably has some of the best beer in the world on the base. And, uh, you and know, you I, guys can't drink. <laughs> yeah. So that, that kind of sucks in a way, uh, but it's a small price to pay. Uh, of course. You know, you're yeah. there to do a job and you're there to, you know, my job is to entertain and fill in the gaps of the show and make sure the shows flow for the musicians and artists and comedians. So you're there for a short time. You're not there for a long time, so you may as well just abide by the rules. Yeah. So, Alira, Alira, have go you ahead, been, Tom. Yeah, Alira, have you been uh, fortunate enough to go to any of the – green bean coffee houses on these bases i have you know there was where was i I think i was in kabul and there was one on the uh the isaf uh headquarters which is you know they call it i think the green zone now because it's the only real area that is you know controlling majority of the middle east um and i think there was a an american coffee house in there and it was amazing you know and at kandahar the famous boardwalk where there was so many, I think thousands of military personnel at one point, there was Hungry Jacks and everything. It's getting pulled yeah. down at the moment. But it was just bizarre to me that on Kabul base, I could go to Hungry Jacks and, and get a Whopper. Yeah. <laughs> like, I was just like, this is surreal. For, um, for the people out there who are listening who um, you know, use normal terminology and the correct way of doing things, <laughs> Jacks is more commonly known as Burger King. 
uh, here in the U.S. <laughs> the, the reason why I brought up green bean at all is because uh, I was wondering if you're familiar with the Moac, which is my favorite drink of all time. It's a 20-ounce coffee with four shots of espresso in it as well. And uh, I can credit that with getting me through many of these trips on week's end. Yeah, no, look, I haven't had that one in particular, but there is one on um, the Dubai base, our Minhad base, where I think they emulate other coffee shops. And I must admit, the four to six shots of coffee, that thing kicked jet lag in the ass. Like I was awake for a couple of days. So... Alira, I mean, you make your living basically off, well, not, not all because of, of your looks and, and your figure, but in large part. So, like, what diet do you subscribe to? Like, are, do you, like, not drink? Do you have anything, any things that, like, really help you stay in top shape year-round? Um, I'm not a big alcohol drinker. Um, I'm not overly into drinking. Um, so that's sort of, you know, I'll have a cheeky beer here and there with my dad when we're cooking the barbecue or whatnot, but... Um, yeah, I kind of just live by a good balance. You know, I, I love boxing. I love doing jujitsu and that burns a lot of calories within itself. So, you know, I do have a sweet tooth. I do love lollies and cakes and all that sort of stuff. But yeah, I just kind of try and stay away from breads and, you know, bad carbs. Um, I love healthy food and I love cooking. Like cooking is my passion. So, I love to just whip up something that's healthy and will sustain my energy. So, you know, but if I am like trying to cut down for shoots and stuff, I honestly live by the Dolce diet. Like that man is amazing. Mike has been a friend for many years and his method of just how he does things, it's easy and I don't feel like I'm I'm crashing and burning. So I love it. Yeah, Mike is one of those guys. He's, you know, he's at the top of his profession. So, yeah. like it, anything remotely negative goes wrong with a guy's cut. They try to let's say that oh, the the Dolce diet is a myth or whatever. I mean, a lot of times, you know, like um this past weekend, Kelvin Gastelum, I know. He, he, he employed Mike uh for a cup uh, maybe one or two of his cuts. And then he thought, hey, I, I know the formula. I can replicate it. I know how to do it. And yeah. he's failed miserably a couple times. And But the thing is also, you know, you can't cut corners with that. You're a professional. And, you know, you can't – you just can't do that. Like if you want to be the best, you've got to work with the best. You've got to roll with the best. And it's unfortunate that Kelvin has had to go through that. And he did look very ill at that weigh-in. He looked – so gaunt and so white and I know that he was sick like a couple of weeks before but you just can't cut corners with nutrition nutrition is just as important as it is for training you know you just can't be a tight ass with that yeah in respect to uh the Kelvin Gaslam situation and this is uh I got some info some inside info from people that were kind of around the situation but uh the way they made it seem to me was that you know it was more of a mental issue um, mm -hmm. going on with him and it was more like he didn't want to cut the weight as opposed to necessarily it being a huge um, medical issue for him but you know that's getting secondhand information um, so the thing that, is it's know, like if you don't want to cut the weight then why are you doing the job you know like it's it's a disappointment it, it, it's only just not Kelvin there's many fighters that have you know not made weight and you think you're a professional here and you're on a big stage if you're going to do it do it right you know, um, I just don't think if you don't want to cut weight, then don't work with the UFC or don't be a fighter. Like there's plenty of other guys that would like to come up and fill your position. You know, it's, it's exactly sure. the same in any job. You're not irreplaceable. And yeah. that's what people need to remember. No one is irreplaceable. Now, I mean, uh, you, as a model, you don't have the luxury of having a walk around weight, you know, like I, I yeah. know, I know guys, you know, they fight at 205, they'll get up to 240. And, you know, they're, they're like, yeah, I feel good. I'm, I'm in shape, man. Yeah. You, you know, you don't have that luxury. So, like, I mean, how much can, can you fluctuate before it's, uh, you're in trouble? But before probably, a big shoot. like, for me personally, like, I probably, I talk in kilos, so this is, like, I don't even understand pounds, but I normally walk around about 60 kilos, um, and I'm happy with that. You know, I'm happy to be curvy and muscly and, and be good with that and feel comfortable and be able to train functionally and happy. But if I am really trying to lean down and get 
my abs completely showing and being completely ripped for a shoot, I'll probably – the lightest I've ever been is around about 50 kilos and I felt like death, like it was horrible, you know, and that's not that's not happy, that's not functional, that's not living. And you don't look like – like you don't look like you've got life in you for your shoot. So to be happy but still be lean, I'd probably walk around about 55, 55 kilos. And just so – if people are wondering, I, I have Google here. So 60, I think it's like 130 pounds or something. Yeah, but. 60 kilos is 132, and 50 kilos is a buck 10, and 55 would be 121 pounds. Yeah, and that's tiny for a woman, you know, especially a woman that – there's a difference between a woman that's skinny and tiny, and then there's a difference between a woman that's tiny and muscular. And I'll never be skinny and tiny because I definitely I have an ass and I have boobs and I've got <laughs> muscles <laughs> and yeah. I'm happy with that. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sure people that follow you on Twitter have noticed that. And <laughs> I don't mind showing off my ass. You know this, but <laughs> uh, yeah, and, and thank- I work hard for that thing. <laughs> no, have you have you seen these uh, pictures there, Tom? Yes. It's <laughs> a slight pause there, Tom. I'm concerned. Uh, I, I don't. I think he, uh, Tom has a girlfriend, so I don't think I don't know if he's allowed to say that he looks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I've seen the pictures. I can I can uh, use can Google for that. <laughs> to my greatest advantage, as long as uh, she's not home. So Just make sure you clear the history. Yeah. Well, I had it in the um, <laughs> like the offline browsing mode on Google. <laughs> so you don't have to worry about it too much. So uh, ju- just to wrap up, and we appreciate all the you know the, the time that you're making for us. So there's got to be you know not everybody on these social media platforms are upstanding gentlemen guys like like myself and, and Tom Lawler. Of so you, course, right? Yeah. So there's got to be some like really like weirdo like creeps. Like give us like a story or two of like the worst creeper. Or like, like the worst experience of somebody you know trying to, you know, pull an angle I, on you. I, you know what? Like I, I get them, but I just don't really pay that much attention to them. But there was one where somebody was impersonating being like a an agent for like a football company, um, like a soccer, a major league soccer company, and they were saying that they wanted to hire. Um, models and presenters for like their functions and just to basically get your number and then you know I'm always very tactful like I've got agents and and whatnot that I kind of facilitate and push things through so it's just like you just try and filter it out but some get through the the loophole and sometimes I just deal with work myself but they're just some of them are just creepy the lengths that they will go to to get your number is just like concerning like it's really concerning but you know it's not my first radio I know I know how to deal with these things. <laughs> so h- how do you usually pull that off, Tom? If I'm trying to get the girl's number? Yeah, and she's just totally way out of your league. Private eye. I find that's usually the easiest. Hire somebody to... Uh, Private eye. On them and, uh, you know what? It's just like I, I honestly love a male that just has the balls to come up to a female and just say, hey, look, here's my number. Like, let's go get coffee or something. Like, I think majority of men need to be like that. They don't need to be coy and creepy and go through social media. Like, I think, you know, they just need to, they just, they don't need to have a tack. Like, tacks are bad. I think you just need to have the balls and just go, look, hey, here you go. But I I hear you on that. But all I hear women say, oh, I I just like confidence and I, I like, like someone that makes me laugh. And it's just like, yeah, but. Of, yeah, that's true, but I don't think you're telling the whole truth. I mean, there's yeah, no, not at all. Like, I don't think women should sugarcoat it. Like, they definitely they don't want a bum that sits at home and plays PlayStations with a headpiece. Like, I think that's <laughs> disgusting. Like, they need a man out there that's going to be hustling and getting things done as well. Um, not sorry if you guys own headpieces for Call of Duty or something, but you know, it's uh, I think a guy needs to be out there earning his keep too. Yeah. Alira, you mentioned uh, if a guy's trying to, you know, get the number to come up and, and ask for coffee or, you know, a coffee yeah. date. Um, I actually did try that technique in Australia. Um, <laughs> for those of us Americans who are not too familiar with the, the different coffees uh, and different terms that are used, in Australia, what mm. we refer to as an Americano would be known as, as a long, a long black. Long black. 
along. <laughs> so uh, there were very many times I would go up to girls and say, hello, you I, I think you're very beautiful. Would you like to join me for a long black? <laughs> and, uh, you can imagine the looks that I would see. <laughs> I could only imagine the looks that you got. You should have yeah. dropped it and said, do you want a short black? <laughs> or a medium. Sh- or a, <laughs> an average one. Also a coffee. So. <laughs> it is a coffee. <laughs> a short white. You know, a- it's, oh, it's just, look, I don't, when I, I get so confused, um, I've got actually a funny story that I need to tell you guys, but um, you know, the lingo between Australians and Americans is just so different that over here in Australia, we use a term that's called come good, which means <laughs> <laughs> like, don't worry, she'll be right, mate. She'll come good, which means it'll be okay. So I was actually talking to uh, someone very important in the UFC office and I was saying about my jet lag and I was like, oh my God, you know, I was so jet lagged. It took me two weeks to come good. And his face just dropped oh, and I was like, oh, no. I'm like, this is so awkward. I was like, no, no, no. I'm like, it means like I'm going to be okay and I couldn't dig myself out of that hole. So th- the lingo between Australian and American is very awkward at times. Very awkward. So do you, is that just a, like a short version of I'll become good? No, like to say like, oh, don't worry, she'll come good means like she'll be fine. She'll be okay. So right. here everybody says it and now when somebody says it, I can't help but laugh and I'm like pulling myself up for saying it because <laughs> when I go over there, I can't use half the words that we use here because it's just awkward and people look at me like, she said what? <laughs> so do you ever lose the Australian accent? Like Never and you, I will never lose my Aussie accent ever. Is it, you know, would I, it be uh, difficult? I don't think it would be difficult. Um but I never want to lose my Australian accent, you know, accent, my God. It like, it just makes me who I am. And in amongst a crowd of an Americans, you stick out like a sore thumb because people gravitate towards your accent. I don't know what it is. Like I think an Australian accent is extremely ugly, but it's unique. There's de- many different levels of a uh, Australian accent. Yeah. I mean, I, I can actually understand every word you're saying because sometimes I – you know, like I can't really understand what they're saying. A lot of the words kind of, kind of mend together. But I, you speak, you know, very, uh, very well. I can, you know, it, it's almost like a, like an English accent. Yeah, it, I don't know if it's because my like presenting over the years, um, I've been sort of taught how to speak, um, because they, I couldn't go in there with the full, you know, trailer trash <laughs> accent. Like I just wouldn't get a job. <laughs> You know, it's one of those things. So over time, I sort of developed that accent where people can understand what I'm saying. Um, but, yeah, you know, I wouldn't want to change it. I never want to lose this accent because it is who I am. Sure. Hey, yeah. Tom, do you, do you have uh, anything before we uh, wrap up with Alira? Uh, yeah, I mean, actually, I have, I have a few questions, but I'll... Yeah, for sure, uh, far away. Yeah, I'll keep it down to uh, just a few. Um, I guess the first one I would have to ask would be who in your mind is a bigger female star, Ronda Rousey or Jamee Private School Girl? <laughs> Jamee, 100%. I love Jamee, but you know I'm a huge Ronda fan. Uh, she's just amazing. She's such a, I don't even know if the word beast is appropriate for a woman, but she's just brutal. She's ruthless. And I'm so excited to watch her fight. Mm. Okay. Another one, uh, would be, you're a fan of professional wrestling, correct? Yeah. You know, here and there, I switch between it. Who is a better representative of Island people? Is it the rock or Jonah? Uh, yes. (laughs) Ah, uh, let's go with Jonah Takalua on that one. That that guy is amazing. And anybody that hasn't seen the series Summer Heights High needs to watch Summer Heights High. Yep. Okay. Uh, better group of fighting brothers, the Diaz's or Angry Boys? Angry Boys. I don't like the Diaz brothers. <laughs> oh, really? 
Full stop. Like, you know, I, I, I need to check myself sometimes because I forget that there's 100,000 people on my Twitter and I'm moaning to 100,000 people. And I was moaning the other day about how, you know, Diaz come in there and he was just, he, he wasn't graceful, but really did I expect anything less from Diaz because he just is the way he is. And I've never met the man personally and I really shouldn't be having an opinion, but I think when you, you go in after a fight and you do what you do and I just think there's just a time and place for cockiness. I understand it's the show business and whatnot, but he just there was no grace about him at the end of it. You know, he, I think he was just rude. And I was like, somebody just get the mic off the douchebag, please. It's <laughs> quite a promo. Wow. Yeah. So I said that on Twitter, and then I just got sprayed by Diaz fans. They were ready to kill me. So I had to take it down. So that's what I mean when I'm having a moan on Twitter about somebody, I need to remind myself that I'm moaning to 100,000 people. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, on that note, um, I guess I guess that's all the questions I have. That's all you uh, think. Yeah, I mean, the only other one that I was kind of wondering was which looks better, more delicious, uh, a burger from grilled <laughs> me. What was the other one, a burger from grilled or you? Or me, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah I, don't I, don't know about this. I don't think she likes you, Dom. Tread, tread. <laughs> I'll say you just to be nice. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> but I need to let you guys know that I do have a, um, I think it's maybe a six to eight page feature coming out in UFC magazine this month. So I think it really? hits, uh, stands on Tuesday. So I'm really excited because I had the opportunity of working with Ryan Loco, who is the, you know, he's a renowned MMA photographer. And I was so stoked that I got to work with him and, we shot in some Roots of Fight gear in Vegas for Fight Week, and, you know, it's been picked up by UFC mags. So, oh. you know, you guys go out and buy it and, and keep it and cherish it and don't laminate it, for God's sake. <laughs> don't laminate it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Ryan Loco is a, a hell of a nice guy. Probably one of the first guys that I met when I kind of got into this sport maybe eight or nine years ago. He was, um, to be honest with you, I really don't know what he did. But I know he's, he, yeah. was, he was friends back then with Mayhem Miller, and then he he kind of got in, taught himself how to shoot uh, a camera, which is mm. and some of his stuff is just amazing. It, he likes to do a lot of black and white features, and he's it, it's phenomenal, just, yeah. absolutely phenomenal. And you know, from a model's perspective, sometimes it's hit and miss with the photographers. You know, you you roll in there and you think it's working, you think you look like amazing and then you get the photos back and you decide oh my god I look like a beast like it just looks wrong <laughs> so it's that hit and miss where it's either going to work or it's not but with Ryan like I knew from the moment that we met and his beautiful girlfriend was there she's Australian and it was just you know it was just funny like it, we just hit it all off and it was just like we've been friends for years but he's just fantastic and I got my photos back and he just captures people in ways that you know nobody else can capture them because he just gets you when you're not looking at the camera and they're the best shots you know I've I've done so many shoots that I love to have something that's different and you know as I'm, I'm getting older unfortunately um, I'm becoming more more open to to arty beautiful shots rather than FHM Maxim styled sexy shoots like it's all just sort of looks the same to me all right, so um, what's, what's your Twitter and where can legitimate people get a hold of you for like hosting or modeling things? Yeah, people can email me through my website. Um, so, you know, there's a direct contact there that they can, they can flick me an email. But I love speaking to people. You know, I'm very active on social media and I always chuck in and hop into banter with people and, you know, I pull people up if they're being inappropriate. So <laughs> don't feel scared to, you know, say hi. And, you know, when I'm in Vegas at fight weeks and stuff, come up and say hello because I really do enjoy interacting with people. As you can tell, I can talk underwater with marbles in my mouth. So, you know, I'm just happy to speak to people. I love I love meeting people. That's what life's about. Well, I mean, it's it's proof, right? You're talking to me and Tom right now. I, I mean, know, that's amazing I enough. Feel I feel so blessed right now. You know, I'm in you, the presence of two great people. You, you've done <laughs> you've done your goodwill uh, for the next five years. <laughs> I've got five years of good luck. Right, right. All right. So, Tom, you can have the last word, buddy. No, uh, I just want to say thanks to Alira for coming on and making um, my very first Make a Wish come true. <laughs> um, so I, I appreciate it, Alira, for coming on the show. 
And uh, no, thank you for having me. Yeah, I also appreciate you being here, Brian. It's good to finally catch up with you after you stood me up this weekend. So. <laughs> I stood you up. Huh? All right. <laughs> Let's wrap this up. Uncle Dana, find something for this young lady to do. She's, um, she can talk on camera and she can, she can walk around in circles with the card too if need be. I think she's overqualified for that. But find something for her to do. Uh, be part of the show. She's got my recommendation. Oh, thank you very much. And guys, it's an absolute pleasure. Thanks, Alira. Appreciate it. Because Tom doesn't take anything seriously, but he's got this <laughs> big head, you know, that like, I, I don't even, like, he totally big league me this weekend in Las Vegas. I was there for four days just hanging wow. out, drinking, you know, talking to people. And I was like, come on, Tom, you know, come, come hang out, come have a few. And he kept stringing me along and he never showed up. Oh, standing up. Not good at well, all. I learned from the best while I was in Australia for a few months uh, with the Australian <laughs> Don't woman. bring us Aussies into the mix. Yeah, the Australian <laughs> This is woman, just you. Uh, <laughs> they showed me how to string people along. Uh, <laughs> and, and Brian, that's really not how the story went down. Completely, but. Um, I'll let you have, you know, I'll let you have your time in the sun and you can uh, think whatever you want. You can, you can frame the story how you'd like, but this revisionist history isn't going to go on forever. So you're not even going to defend yourself? You're not even going to tell the... <laughs> what do you, do you want me to use the Anderson Silva excuse? Yeah. And say <laughs> that nothing happened, nothing was wrong. Um, <laughs> I'll give you the... That's a real story too. Yeah. Well, hey, it's legit. <laughs> <laughs> I am. I'm the Brooklyn brawler of the UFC yeah. currently. So yeah, she asked, "What is enhancement?" I think like she thought maybe it was like something like, you know, uh, dirty or something. She's like, "What does this mean? Who is this guy?" Yeah, maybe, <laughs> maybe uh, you know, a reference to Viagra or yeah. uh, what are the extends pills? Are those the ones that you're thinking about? Natural male enhancement. Is, was that where you were going with that earlier? <laughs> Oh, I just got cut off from you guys, and I was like, oh, hang on, what's going on here? I'm like, it's all quiet, so I just missed that whole conversation that you guys just had with me. Oh, you, so, you, um, you definitely know Paul Heyman. You're so, you, I do, I do. He's such a lovely guy. You know, he's, uh, he's a very influential man, and he's helped out my career like you wouldn't, you wouldn't believe. So I'm very lucky that I'm in his little wolf pack. Yeah. Well, don't worry, Alira. The only stuff that we said while you weren't listening was how beautiful you are. And <laughs> how great of a guest you are. So don't worry. I'll, about, I'll, <laughs> worry about I'll kill you later when I listen back. <laughs> uh, so it, we just went from talking about um, Masterone and Androstein or Androstein mm. to uh, to Alira Core. So it's a, it's a nice uh, <laughs> transition. So what's your background? You know, you're obviously from Australia, but. Tell us your yeah. background, you know, what were you like in high school? Were you, were you cool in high school or were you one of these, one of these girls that just kind of like everything came together in your 20s? Uh, you, know, you know, a bit of both. Like growing up, um, you know, I think majority of Australian young women, we're, we're pretty laid back. We, you know, we enjoy the surf. We're pretty tomboyish. So we don't take things too seriously and, some sort of, you know, wake up and go the other way and become prima donnas and the others kind of just stay cool and, you know, end up falling on their feet in a modeling career but still have that very tomboyish aspect. And that's exactly where I'm at. You know, anybody that meets me knows that I haven't really changed that much from when I was younger. Um, I don't take, don't take things too seriously, but I take my work seriously. Um, so, you know, I'm pretty cruisy and it's kind of stayed the same really. See, that's interesting. The following announcement has been paid for by the New World Order. Remember this, when you're the greatest fighter in the world today, they got a name for you. They don't call you a great fighter, they call you Chael Sonnen. Beat me, if you can. And after tonight, none of you in this ring will ever Again! You're talking to the Rolex wearing diamond ring wearing.
Kid stealing, woo, wheeling, dealing, limousine light, jet flying, son of a gun, and I'm having a hard time holding these alligators down. Woo! I'm going to drink a Coors Light. That's a Coors Light because Bud Light won't pay me nothing. And I have in my cold beer. You have your cold beer? If not, you are fucking jabroni. Wash it down with one beer, two beers, three beers, a shot of whiskey. You become a motherfucker. The following announcement has been paid for by the New World Order. All right, welcome to the Filthy FRB Show. And this is a little bit different guest than uh, you guys are accustomed to because I know you guys like fighting and you like women. So I, I, we've covered the fighting part of things and we needed to bring in the estrogen part of this. She's a uh, FHM Hot 50 name to that list as well as a Maxim Hot 100. She's a, a Paul Heyman girl. And she's the one who uh, hit me up and said, hey, who's this guy who has his Twitter profile that says UFC enhancement talent? <laughs> Alira Coors, how are you doing? I'm good. Thank you, guys. Thanks for having me. <laughs> that's, hey, Tom, 